Well, good evening. My name is Dr. Ken Gilman. Uh, we're just into the early part of 2020 here in the tropics of Northern Australia. So may, first of all, I wish all my colleagues uh, a happy and interesting 2020. Cheers. Mmm. That's a delicious Australian Riesling. Australia makes the best Rieslings in the world, in my view. This talk is specifically about tyramine and how to advise the patients that you see about the diet they need to follow. Now, there'll be all sorts of people listening to this, uh, either as uh, a video or as a podcast. So for those of you who are listening as a podcast, uh, you have to imagine me tasting my lovely glass of wine there and imagine seeing me. Uh, <clears throat> and for those of you watching, well, here I am. Now, I have to do a little bit of an introduction because not everybody knows who I am and what I've written and published about MAIs. And for the purpose of this talk, apart from reminding everyone that there's a great deal of information not only in my scientific papers which you should be able to access but I can send you copies of if you have any difficulty accessing them. Many of them are available uh, free. Um, it's a bit variable nowadays isn't it with publishers being fairly uh, keen on maximising their income. Uh, but uh, a lot of them are available free, especially the editorials. And the seminal paper I wrote on tricyclic antidepressants is available free from the British Journal of Pharmacology. Anyway, apart from the scientific papers I've published, uh, there's a wealth of information on my website. And in many ways, that's better information because, as those of you who've had anything to do with publishing are probably aware, it can sometimes be a little diverting shall we say that you sometimes to pacify the referees have to change things which you'd rather not change uh, and sadly so many scientific journals seem to require a rather dull and stilted form of presentation which is really very uninspiring to read never mind so for those who don't know there's a lot of information in the peer-reviewed literature and especially on my website. Uh, and on my website also, uh, there are several PDF documents that people, doctors and patients, can download with advice about tyramine, etc, etc. The main one in relation to this talk is the long monograph on the website. Uh, that's been there for a long time and has been developing over the years. It's about 100 pages with probably close to 500 references now. And it's the only source in the literature of original, up-to-date measurements of tyramine in food. I won't go on about this, but the medical literature has become a little blinkered, or has always been a little blinkered, uh, and not taken advantage of the large amount of data that's in the food science literature, which of course is not on PubMed. So that's one of the reasons that my publications contain a lot of original data that isn't in the rest of the literature, because I've looked at that alternative source of information, which is a very rich source of information. So anybody who wants to take up the baton and advance the cause with further knowledge about the tyramine content of different obscure foods, make sure you do a search of all the food science literature, not PubMed literature. And let me know if you find anything interesting. One can't keep up with everything, so I'm sure there's a bit more information since I did extensive searches a little while ago. <clears throat> 
I do update that document and I've just posted the 2020 version or, or Heidi, my IT assistant, will be posting it very, very soon. And that's a very important reference source. It's very long and nobody's expected to read it at one sitting. Uh, but I'm about to give my opinion on how doctors should be playing their role in dealing with all of this. So I'll speak about that in a moment. The paper that I published in the Journal of Neural Transmission, one of the old European journals of some repute, I gather, uh, was sort of uh, the peer-reviewed publication of the data I'm referring to in the monograph that's on the website. But as with so many journal publications, it wasn't quite what it should have been. I won't go into that, but I'm becoming more and more disinclined to publish papers in scientific journals. So, those are the two main sources of uh, information. Now, when I was doing that paper for the Journal of Neural Transmission, one of the major problems I had with them was right at the outset, when they invited me to write the paper, I told them that I was not proposing to produce a simplified table of the tyramine content of different foods because I was quite sure that it was uh, a pointless and useless and misleading exercise. And then at the last minute they decided they wanted a table. Uh, and I said to them, no, if you want to throw the whole paper away, throw it away, but I'm not going to produce a table for you and I'm not wasting any more time with toing and froing and discussion of all this issue. Uh, I just don't have the energy to do it and the time and I've got a life to lead. Anyway, enough, I'm not going to tell that whole story, it's pointless. But the purpose of just mentioning it is that you can't write a simplified list or table of what is and isn't safe. Uh, and anybody who thinks you can, in my view, does not understand the whole business of how you go about understanding this business. So that's one of the reasons I'm giving this talk to my professional colleagues. Uh, and there'll be some people, doubtless, who don't see it the way I see it. But I'm going to tell you how I see it. Our duty as specialists, experts, is to be experts. Uh, if you're going to charge high fees for being an expert, whether you're a barrister or a specialist psychopharmacologist, then I think you're duty-bound to have a proper knowledge of the subject. And I think it's time doctors faced up to the fact that their pharmacological knowledge and their knowledge about tyramine has been... Um, a little bit less than satisfactory. And many of the review papers that are in the literature are really not at all satisfactory. Perhaps I should limit my comments to just saying that for fear of offending too many people. So the important thing for us as specialists to do is to understand a bit about food. I'll talk about that in relation to cheese and soy sauce and such like in uh, a short while. So first of all, we need to be more knowledgeable about food and how it's produced. And then part two of that, about why some foods contain tyramine and others don't. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about that and uh, just uh, just uh, highlight that that's a lot of what my um, publications and the information on the website is about. And since, oh, excuse me, since this talk is meant to 
be suitable for people who are starting off their knowledge on this subject, let me start by explaining something very simple. And that is, of course, most normal foods that are not processed by, a pro by um, bacterial action, fermentation, maturation, etc., simply do not contain tyramine, end of story. No natural foods have high enough levels of tyramine to cause a problem. The only foods that can accumulate tyramine to the level that can cause a problem, and let's define exactly what that is right at the outset, uh, that means you know, 100 milligrams per kilogram, uh, or 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, which now is extremely exceptional. Now then, another fundamental principle is that the foods that are produced like this, cheese, soy sauce, etc., etc., the reason they're produced like that is because it intensifies those protein-related flavours related to biogenic amines, putrescine, spermidine, histidine, tyramine, etc., etc., which produce the rich flavours to do with unami and glutamate and all these things. And of course, that whole business and process is relatively time-consuming and therefore foods like that are more expensive. That's a very simple basic principle to remain aware of, in my opinion. Because, of course, it means that almost all of them are used in smaller quantities because they have more intense flavours. So let's just start off with a brief recap of the amount of tyramine in different sorts of foods and how it accumulates. First of all, Almost all modern food chains and food production processes in Western countries and countries that trade commodities with Western countries are now very tightly regulated for all sorts of different reasons that I won't go into. So what that means in practice is that a great majority of all of these sorts of foods like cheese, soy sauce, salamis, are now produced using engineered starter cultures which do not have the kinds of organisms in them that are capable of producing tyramine, which is produced by decarboxylation of tyrosine. So it's the decarboxylase enzymes that are prominent in certain microorganisms uh, that are responsible for the production of tyramine. And as I say, not all organisms do that, not even are capable of it necessarily, and of course they only do it under certain environmental and metabolic conditions. And that's why it's been possible uh, for the scientists who, uh, uh, the scientists who uh, do this kind of work in food technology to produce starter cultures for people who make all these things, sourdough bread, salami, blah, 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 uh, that more or less bereft of organisms that are capable of producing tyramine. And that means that the typical cheeses that are produced now have levels of tyramine in that are a tenth or even a hundredth of the levels that Barry Blackwell uh, measured in his excellent early work. Uh, Barry is still around. I've communicated with him recently. Um, many people could benefit by going back and reading the papers that Barry wrote way back in the, uh, was it the 60s? It was an awfully long time ago. Um, they measured, you know, levels of 3,000 milligrams per kilogram of tyramine. Uh, if you look at my monograph, huge numbers of cheeses have been assayed. And even the matured cheeses like Stilton, Parmigiano, Reggiano, um, and so on and so on, actually contain quite low, low levels of tyramine. Uh, the English cheddar that was assayed, some of the samples had no tyramine at all that was measurable, and the measurement techniques are now better and more sensitive and more reliable than they used to be. I think some of the older measurements have to be taken with a fairly large pinch of salt. Um, so, engineered starter cultures for all of these things, like soy sauce, everything. 
I must tell you an amusing little aside story. This was really rather sweet. Several years ago, I got an inquiry from a Vietnamese gentleman who owned the, what do you call it, a fish sauce, you know, Lick and Garrowan, as the Romans used to call it, the fish sauce production facility on one of the little islands off the coast of Vietnam, which was an old family firm, which apparently has a, uh, a, a great and famous name for producing specially good fish sauce out of, you know, anchovies. They use all sorts of things, anchovies and God knows what else. Stirred up and fermented. <laughs> Sounds like I, I, I like fish sauce. Don't get me wrong, but I mean I, I imagine the process is a little bit on the nose. Uh, anyway, this dear gentleman wanted my advice on how he could make sure that his fish sauce produced by his little family company uh, had uh, low levels of tyramine in it, because of course he wanted to export to the gourmet London restaurants and New York restaurants and things like that and get into that, you know, um, high price market niche. Uh, and, and I thought, isn't that just a great illustration of how widespread this whole idea of, of you know, controlling the process of fermentation and production of these different biogenic amines, uh, it's even reached a little island off Vietnam. I thought that was rather sweet. So I advised him. Um, so that gives you an idea of how widespread the control of food production is and how that's uh, influenced the much, much lower levels of tyramine uh, that are in a great majority of the foods that people in Western countries now consume. There will, of course, always be exceptions. And not only is tyramine produced during the, I guess one can't use the word manufacture, can one? The, the production, the artisan production of these wonderful products. And a lot of them, I love them, they're delicious. Um, although the actual production may be better controlled, they're not necessarily always stored uh, appropriately. So it is necessary to remember, and, and I've emphasised this quite strongly in my uh, information, that once things are purchased, it's essential that they are kept in a fridge that's capable of maintaining you know, 4 centigrade or less as a temperature. And a lot of domestic fridges are not uh, so capable and it is important to speak to patients about making sure that they uh, are aware of what their fridge temperature is and how long they're keeping things uh, and making sure that they're uh, stored properly. That, that is quite important. Uh, so not only is it the food production process, but it's the storage afterwards, which is also worthwhile being aware of and paying attention to and educating patients about. This I guess illustrates, let, let's use cheese as an example of this. This illustrates I think my argument about a list being absolutely hopeless. You can't give people a list that says cheese type X is dangerous, cheese type Y is safe. It just isn't possible. Um, people have to understand they need to be sensible and be educated uh, and uh, act accordingly. So for instance with cheese we can say, and this is where a lot of doctors may need to uh, increase their knowledge a bit of food and food production and uh, so on, different sorts of cheeses made in different ways and different styles. Uh, let's take the fresh type cheeses like bocconcini, mozzarella, uh, fromage fray, etc. Mascarpone, call it a cheese if you like. They're not produced by a process of fermentation and they have a very low shelf life uh, and they're marketed fresh. They don't contain tyramine. If somebody took one of those that was contaminated or had been on a shelf in some poorly managed 
outlet that had kept it way beyond its use-by date, etc., 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 and then they kept it in their own fridge at the wrong temperature, it could possibly accumulate tyramine and become a problem. But generally, well, not generally, those sorts of cheeses, fresh cheeses, simply don't have tyramine, nor does yogurt, of course. It is only cheeses that are produced by a longer process of maturation that can sometimes accumulate tyramine. But even those, and go to the monograph and look at the large numbers of references and, and the large amount of data on the different sorts of cheeses, and you'll see that even the fancy cheeses like Roquefort, uh, I wasn't able to find many measurements for Roquefort, but some of them had no tyramine at all. Uh, I don't think any of them had more than a couple of hundred milligrams per kilogram per kilogram. I'm sorry, people in North America really just have to get to grips with the fact they've got to learn about you know mills and, 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 and kilograms and stuff. You can't do this kind of stuff in ounces and, and, and stuff. It's ridiculous. Um, get up to speed. Stop crashing spacecraft on Mars and learn how to do units properly. Um, so uh, if you've got a cheese like that, and that's a very typical uh, matured cheese, uh, whether it's a, a cheddar, a parmigiano, reggiano, or whatever, it's unlikely to have more than 200 milligrams per kilogram or thereabouts. So what does that mean? Well, if we say that it's certain that 10 milligrams of tyramine is not going to be sufficient to cause a serious reaction, in somebody who's uh, on an MAOI. 200 milligrams per kilogram, 20 grams of tyramine in 100 grams of cheese, right? Now, 25 milligrams of cheese is a healthy portion. 50 milligrams is a large portion. So again, it's our role as doctors to educate people about diet and healthy eating and make them realize that if they're gluttons and they eat one or two hundred milligrams of cheese uh, then they're going to be at considerably well not considerably at somewhat increased risk uh, with certain sorts of foods like that if they want to take that risk well that's up to them it's their choice we must all make choices about the degree of risk we would want to take in life, whether it's driving cars or climbing mountains or whatever. So it's a question of educating people that if they eat cheese in sensible quantities, then even cheeses like that, that have relatively high amounts of tyramine in our modern era, are not going to contain enough tyramine to cause a serious reaction. But you can't produce a table and list different types of cheeses and say one's safe and one isn't. It just, it's ridiculous, you know? It, it, it's this disease that we have nowadays where everybody wants something oversimplified. What's the take-home message? I was asked at the end of one lecture once. I said, the take-home message is pay attention to the bloody lecture. Then you'll know what you're talking about. Cheers. Um, mm. Mm, mm. Oh, that's exquisite. Riesling has a very low pH, 3.5, uh, and it's by far the best thing for making sure that you don't get a dry mouth if you're speaking in public. So drinking water is absolutely pointless. Doesn't increase salivary production, doesn't do any good at all. You either have to drink well carbonated water, which of course is much more acidic, and acidity stimulates salivary flow, or in my opinion much better, drink Riesling. I think J. Amsterdam calls it somebody's psychopharmacology, but since I'm an atheist I call it nature's psychopharmacology. Okay, so simplified, simplistic lists are not useful. That's my firm opinion. Um, 
a sort of slight side issue from this. I would suggest to people who like to have uh, a useful relationship with their patients that the whole process of educating people about this kind of thing uh, and of uh, communicating this information is an excellent way of improving your relationship and communication with your patients. Uh, education's quite an um, enjoyable exercise. Uh, and I, I really do suggest to people that if they get into the habit of doing this sort of thing and educating their patients a bit better, they'll find it interesting, enjoyable and rewarding. That's perhaps well worth saying. Um, just since I've had my cataracts done, I need reading glasses. Um, just trying to think what the next best example is to help people develop their uh, understanding about this. Perhaps something like Marmite, Vegemite, I don't know what the equivalent of that in North America is, but here in Australia they have stuff called Vegemite. Marmite was the sort of black gooey stuff produced in the UK from the uh, remnants of the brewing process in Burton-on-Trent. I think it was produced uh, as a wartime food supplement originally. It's processed from brewer's yeast. Of course, let, let's have another version here to make it interesting. This is actually all to do with umami. I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with umami. Uh, there is actually a uh, specific commentary on the website about the whole business of uh, food science, taste and genetics uh, and what we now know about how uh, our taste buds guide us as to what to eat and what not to eat. It's a very, very interesting subject. Uh, and that explains in detail the whole business of the food tastant of umami, which was established as the fifth taste modality uh, only quite recently. As I said in the article, if you look at uh, the benchmark cookbooks of the last few decades, most of them hardly mention it. McGee's huge book on food science, uh, I think the latest edition was probably 10 years ago, um, only devoted one of its 800 pages to a discussion of umami. It's partly, I think, a little bit of sort of xenophobia uh, because people think it, umami is all to do with Japanese food. And uh, I think that there has been a certain amount of sidelining of that because it's not American, not English kind of thing. But that's actually misguided because this is, I said this was going to be a slight diversion, but I think it's an important one to understand. In actual fact, this whole story started with the famous French, French chef Escoffier, uh, who wrote the foreword to La Russe Gastronomique. Um, and he described his veal stock, which was his you know, famous stock, as having a special, unique taste. And I think looking back, it's almost without doubt that he was describing umami long before anybody else. Probably the first uh, recognised description of umami. But then Maggie. I would imagine there are huge numbers of people who recognise that name. Maggie, M-A-G-G-I, Maggie Stock Cubes. They were invented by Julius Maggie in the latter part of the 19th century. I think he was 1830 to 1900 or thereabouts, I can't remember, 
read the commentary and you'll see. He discovered that hydrolyzing vegetable protein produced a meat-like broth. And that was because what he was doing was increasing the levels of glutamate. And it's glutamate that's one of the amino acids, of course. It's not an essential amino acid. Uh, glutamate is responsible for the umami taste. I won't go into that in detail. Uh, so he commercialized it and produced soups and stock cubes uh, and his company, his eponymous company, uh, still carries his name uh, and uh, has continued producing those things. So it was really him uh, that, following on from Escoffier's thoughts, uh, produced the first glutamate-enhanced foods uh, that had that extra richness and, and pleasant taste that's associated, of course, with protein. And because humans are omnivores, evolution's equipped us with the ability to be quite discriminating about different sorts of protein in our diet, presumably as a guide to, you know, get directing us to high-class protein sources of food. So they are Julius Maggi and, and the origin of glutamate. And then, of course, it was sort of quite rediscovered, but the most modern writers seem to think it was this Aikido fellow in Japan who discovered umami and, and wrote about it and named it and isolated it. And, uh, he, he was the fellow who realised it was glutamate, not just something else. So, so I suppose he, he did discover that. And that was around the turn of the century, 1905 or something. That paper, this shows how insular English-speaking people are from all continents are, that paper was not reproduced in English until 10 years ago or something. It's extraordinary. Uh, and of course we've had all this nonsense in the last 20 or 30 years about the Chinese restaurant syndrome and you know, MSG. But of course this is utter nonsense. MSG is monosodium glutamate, so it's just the sodium salt of glutamate. I mean, just as your body can't tell the difference between sodium ions that come from the food you eat or from salt that you take, uh, so, of course, the body can't tell the difference between glutamate that's part of the food you eat or glutamate that's added as a seasoning. Um, uh, and yet, even now, I think you'll find that a great many foods boast as a, an advertising thing that they don't contain monosodium glutamate. It's, it's nonsense, it's crazy. Glutamate is glutamate is glutamate, as Gertrude Stein might have said. A bit of an aside, but the point of it is to help people understand that those flavours of richness uh, that satisfy people more rapidly with smaller quantities are all part of the whole process of producing biogenic amines in foods through processes of, of maturation and etc 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 and of course cheeses develop high levels of glutamate when they're produced in certain ways so that's probably why uh, older you know three five year old parmigiano reggiano uh, is perceived as having a richer, deeper flavour than much younger cheeses because it has a higher quantity of glutamate. And just, of course, as things like glutamate gradually increase in cheeses like that that are stored in carefully controlled conditions over many, many months and sometimes a few years, a little bit of tyramine can accumulate as well, uh, but not huge amounts. And as has sometimes been said in the past, actually correctly, uh, much more in the rind than the inner part of the cheese. But if you look at the data in the uh, monograph on the website, uh, you'll see that even aged Gouda, Parmigiano, etc., etc., rarely accumulates huge levels of tyramine. So even those aged cheeses 
are going to be safe in sensible small quantities, right? I mean, look, I don't know how recently any of you have bought, you know, three to five year old Parmigiano Reggiano, but in Australia it costs about $120 a kilo. It's extremely expensive. Um, so, you know, not many people are going to eat very large quantities of that or caviar, um, <laughs> which in fact doesn't contain tyramine unless it's been badly stored. Um, <laughs> fish roe, you know, properly prepared dried fish roe doesn't contain a lot of tyramine. And again, you eat it in very small quantities. Uh, soy sauce, let's finish. Uh, how long has this been going on for? Well, long enough, nearly. Um, a brief word about soy sauce is another very good example. Uh, again, go to the monograph. Most soy sauces don't contain very much tyramine. Uh, they're commercial products, they're not aged over huge periods of time, uh, and uh, their levels of tyramine are quite low. So when they're used in, tar uh, in condiment type quantities, they're going to be quite safe. Um, a bit like all of these things, again, education, understanding a bit about it, and just being a little bit sensible and careful uh, is appropriate. Uh, but the idea that you can't touch the stuff or your head will blow apart is just rubbish. You will find occasionally, and again, especially in, you know, homemade Eastern or Chinese ones or whatever, um, people have measured high levels of tyramine, like a thousand milligrams per litre. Um, and those are ones you'd have to be jolly careful with because even 10 mils of that uh, would you know, be getting to the stage of being a little bit risky. But look, those very highly flavoured soy sauces, I, I don't know what other people do, but again, they're condiments. You, you put very small amounts on what you're eating. You, you don't pour 100 mils on, at least you certainly shouldn't. So again, it's a question of knowledge and education. Well, look, I hope that this has given people the resources, the papers, peer-reviewed papers, and, and particularly what's on the website. The website's often a better, easier, quicker place to go for information than peer-reviewed papers. Um, and an understanding of it, uh, uh, and equipped you with the ability to communicate knowledge better to your patients uh, and therefore to help them to get confident about using these drugs uh, and, and managing their diet in a sensible way without panic, panicking about things. I guess the last thing I'd say is my experience is that it's very important to keep revisiting this business. In the first week or three that you put people on them, you know, you, you start educating, uh, I would strongly recommend giving written material to the patient. Obviously, they can refer themselves to the website and read it for themselves, but I think it's individual practitioners' responsibility to make sure people have got access to written information and add to that other resources as well as appropriate, depending on the patient's um, educational level and so on and so on. Educational level, that's the last thing that's really, really important, I think. The other reason I think that you can't produce just a simple list for people is because everybody's different, whether it's their ethnic background and their dietary habits in relation to that, um, whether it's their educational level and their basic intelligence and so on and so on. Uh, and so what's suitable as a way to explain something to one patient from one background is not suitable for another patient from a different background. So, you know, a, a simplified list is just, in my view, an, an utter nonsense. Uh, I also think it's an abrogation of our role to treat patients as individuals and help them make individual decisions about what they do. Because, of course, everybody has a different attitude to risk. It's not up to us to dictate to people what is and isn't safe and appropriate. Everybody takes different risks in their life about different things, whether it's driving cars, climbing mountains, what I've heard to before.
Uh, and so I think that it's appropriate for us to take those factors into account and advise people according to their attitude to those kinds of things and their knowledge and their background and cultural factors and everything else. Uh, advise them uh, and inform them uh, as individuals, not give them pre-written lists and, you know, go home, read that. Don't think that's good enough. All right. Well, I do hope people find that helpful. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And hopefully you'll find some of the other material on the website helpful as well. Goodbye for now.